We're going to talk about some interesting stuff today, kids, some weird stuff. We are going to talk about World War II in the context of the classic Britcom Hello, Hello. We're going to talk about what you can't get away with on television anymore. We're going to talk about some new music that is either a great tribute to or a blatant ripoff of Cinderella. Could be one, could be the other, could be both, and... We'll get to it on the other side. Hello, you're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I do not do a lot of television, okay? This is not a great secret. I confessed on last week's episode (laughs) that I spend a disproportionate amount of time watching Frasier reruns on the CMT. That is a typical Saturday night for your boy, Frasier on the CMT. And, you know, I like Seattle. I enjoyed it. The few hours that I spent there recently, and I feel a kinship with the Frasier, but it seems to me just a little bit sad (laughs) that I spend, you know, what little TV time I have, I tend to spend watching American sitcom reruns. I thought I would do one better. You know, I was watching Ted Lasso, okay, so I was dedicated to Ted Lasso. That series is now over, and it's always sad. When a series ends that you've committed to. And I can remember throughout the annals of my television watching history. Watching final episodes of programs. Final episode of Three's Company. (laughs) Which I watched, you know, after the fact. But if you grew up in a certain period of time, if you were a kid in the late 70s through the mid 80s, you saw every episode of Three's Company, right? You saw them all, the pratfalls of Jack Tripper. You saw them all on reruns after school. <laughs> you couldn't even show that, that show, I'm sure, on TV anymore. But you used to watch them after school as part of your pre-dinner preparation. And so you saw the final episode, it made you sad. The final episode of MASH, I have talked about more than once on this program, absolutely devastated me as a 10-year-old. Never having watched MASH before, (laughs) I have found myself watching, I believe it is still the most watched television event of all time, the final episode of MASH, I watched that, that final scene still gets me, still gets me every time. And when I was a 10-year-old boy, very sensitive, watching that on the TV, never having seen MASH before, it obliterated me, man. Even then... I was a history guy, and even then, I recognized a dramatic moment. Even then, I recognized and was sensitive to sentimentality. Final episode of Night Court, I recall. Final episode of Seinfeld was an event. Everybody gathered to watch the end of Seinfeld, and I have been upset, saddened, felt a certain melancholy about the final episodes of NYPD Blue the final episode of ER, and it goes on and on and on, you know? Over time, especially shows that run for a very long time, you develop a connection, at least I do, to the characters. They become like friends in your world, you know, the people you hang out with. I don't know if TV is the same anymore. TV used to be a shared experience, you know what I mean? I'm not sure it is that anymore, but it used to be pre-streaming, that you had to watch the episodes as they were released. Thursday nights, whatever it was, and you had to gather. And so I think there was more of a sense of a collective shared experience of these characters and these stories. I don't know. I think that added a layer to the experience of watching those programs. And then the next day, You would talk about it with folks at school or folks around the cooler at the office (laughs) because everybody worked in an office, man. 
This was pre-pandemic, of course. And so, nowadays, I don't think we get that as much, you know? We binge-watch programs or something that aired three years ago. It's like, oh, I never really did check that out. Maybe I should. And so the shared experience is not so much there anymore. And I think, I think just a little bit, we have lost something. And that might be just indicative of a general loss of community. You know, in some ways, the online world has opened us up to communities. You can more completely and with more dedication follow Arsenal now because you can join online communities and you can listen to Arsenal Vision and you can listen to the Arscast and you can follow things and there is a community. You know, you can be much more specific, I suppose, in your communities. But I think that wider collective has been in some ways lost and I think TV was part of that. This is not a well thought out argument. (laughs) It's just occurring to me as I'm talking to you right now. But it seems to me there was something quaint and collective about TV before that does not exist so much now. And yet, there is more opportunity than ever to be part of global communities dedicated to your particular interests. And all I'm really saying is, felt a bit sad to be watching Frasier reruns, and now that Ted Lasso is over, and I am saddened by that, but not as devastated as I thought I might be. Fact is, I'm probably maturing, kids, as I sneak up on the golden age of 50. (laughs) Maybe I'm reaching a point now where I am less connected to fictional characters on my television device. Although, the second last episode of Ted Lasso brought, you know, I got Misty. They're very good at sentiment on that program. They're very good at emotions. They're very good at moments. And the first season of Ted Lasso is some of the best television I've watched in the last, I say, 10 years or so, at least. That was a really fabulous. The first season is really, really terrific. It is lighthearted. It is sentimental. At a time when we needed lighthearted and sentimental, okay, this came out of the pandemic era. We needed something to latch on to that seemed a little bit wholesome, with just a bit of an edge, but wholesome, lighthearted, nice, kind. You know what I mean? There was a compassion. There was a goodness to Ted Lasso that I think the world needed, especially as things got more and more vitriolic and things went haywire. And we still see that going on now. And I don't want to get into it because we're about positive talk on here, okay? But I have dedicated myself. All of that to say, I have dedicated myself in the past week or so to revisiting, beginning at episode one, the British sitcom LOLO. Do you know LOLO? All right, this was a show that ran from 1982 to 1992. British sitcom set during the German occupation of France in World War II. And there is a certain fearful synchronicity in that, kids, because it was on this date, as I am releasing this, June 14th, 1940, that the German army occupied Paris. Whoa! And that, and that, I say occupied, they were ushered in. (laughs) They took Paris They went into Paris without a fight. The French government, the French army fled as the Germans were approaching. The reason being, we do not want to defend Paris because in the defense, Paris will be destroyed. And if you look at what became of other cities in Europe and elsewhere around the world that were fought over in World War II, complete devastation, man. Stalingrad, Leningrad, Berlin itself, completely freaking destroyed. The French had enough foresight, which would have been useful earlier. They had enough foresight in 1940 to say, if we defend Paris, Paris will be destroyed. So let us flee Paris. Let us leave Paris to the Nazis and we will go elsewhere. They did that. The Nazis walked in without firing a shot, really, found the police on the street. (laughs) It's like, oh, I guess we're in charge now. 
And that begins, that sets the premise for Hello, hello. That sets the historical premise for this sitcom. Should we do a little history? Shall we jump just now into a little bit of history? Okay, World War II, we're going to go super superficial here, okay? World War II was not supposed to happen. <laughs> End of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1919, made it very clear that Germany was not supposed to be allowed to become capable of making war again, all right? Among many punishments delivered upon Germany after World War I, which laid the foundation for the rise of a make Germany great again sort of a person, which is exactly what happened. Let's not go there, all right? Not just yet, at least. The provisions of the Treaty of Versailles 1919, among many, many other things, said, Germany shall not have a military capable of aggressive war, okay? A nominal self-defense kind of military was allowed. I think something like 100,000 troops, something like that. We're going to put limits on the German capacity to make warfare because we saw what happened when there weren't any limits. You know what I mean? Fair enough. So, among the other provisions of the Treaty of Versailles, that goes into effect. We are hacking the German military down to almost nothing, a nominal defensive force. And almost immediately, the German government begins secretly rearming. On the sly, we're going to start just having more troops than they said we should. And we're going to work on some weaponry, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And whether the Western powers knew or not, they probably had their suspicions. They let it slide, all right? Then early 30s, Herr Hitler himself is elected, legally elected, to the German chancellorship. And very quickly sets about making himself the supreme, unopposed dictator of Germany. And this is when the rearmament really starts to scale up, okay? Because Hitler's whole thing was restoring German glory, all right? The Thousand-Year Reich. Finding Lebensraum, living space, for the German Empire, the German race, the German people, his, you know, his mandate from above is to get space to restore Germany's glory, and to mete out punishment on those who humiliated and subjugated the German people, beginning with Jews and Bolshevists in particular, and casting glances askew at Britain, France, America, etc., all right? And so if you're going to do that, all right, if you are going to build a thousand-year Reich and carve out this massive empire and take over the world, you're going to need more than 100,000 troops, kids. You know what I mean? And so Hitler really ramps up German rearmament. And everybody knows this is happening. And there's no appetite. <laughs> there is no appetite to oppose this. All right, people still have fresh in their collective conscious, fresh in their memories, World War I. World War I was an atrocity against humanity, okay? 20 million people died, give or take. Empires collapsed, economies collapsed. The whole world was utterly shocked and devastated by the capability of modern weapons, of the power of modern industrial warfare. It was a nightmare that remained dark on the consciousness of all peoples involved in that horrendous and unnecessary, by the way, conflict. There was no appetite to throw another generation of young men into the meat grinder, into the maw of modern industrial warfare. And so they let Hitler rebuild the German military. And then when he said, hmm, they don't seem to be stopping me here. 
that he started to put into place his plans very subtly, one small step at a time, to build this Lebensraum, this living space, to conquer territories for the German people. One of the first things he did was march his troops into the Rhineland. The Rhineland is a section of Germany, borders France, Belgium, Netherlands, a demilitarized zone after World War I, a DMZ, a little buffer, a little buffer between the aggressive Germans and the peace-loving Western nations, right? So we're going to make the Rhineland a demilitarized zone, not allowed to put troops in there, Germany. Well, Hitler, feeling emboldened, puts troops into the Rhineland. And the British and the French raise their eyebrows and they hum and ha, but ultimately they let it slide because we don't want another war, man. So what we're going to do with this strange little man over in Germany is we're going to appease him. And so they put into place this policy of appeasement, thinking if we let the little guy do his thing just a bit, doesn't hurt anybody, let him have his fun, let him do his thing, maybe, maybe he'll be satisfied with that and he won't provoke a second world war. And of course, the little guy is going to take everything they'll offer and negotiate in bad faith and do his Hitler thing. All right, we can see this in retrospect. He's doing his Hitler thing. So he occupies the Rhineland. Nobody cares all that much. And then he says, well, Austria is our traditional ally. It's a Germanic population. Many Germans in Austria, it's only right and well that Austria should join the German Empire. And so German troops march into Austria and, according to the propaganda, are treated like our traditional heroes. Our brothers from the Deutschland have come, and we are all unified again. And the Western powers look at that and go, eh, okay, we'll appease the little guy on that. You know, no harm done. The Austrians seem to be happy with it, so okay. Hitler looks around and says, well, you know, I don't really have at this moment the military to go full on against major powers like Britain, like France. They don't really seem to know that. <laughs> and there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity as all of this was going on in the 30s for the Western powers to make a military intervention that the Nazis were not prepared to deal with. The opportunity was there to nip this in the bud, militarily speaking. That option was not taken because, again, we don't want another World War I, man. We don't want that. So they let Hitler do the thing. They appeased him, the policy of appeasement. And then Hitler turns his eyes upon the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland being a strip of what used to be northern Czechoslovakia with a lot of German people, all right? Hitler's context, Hitler's justification for a lot of this was we are reuniting the German people, that should be allowed. Self-determination, all right? Where there are German populations, they belong as part of Germany. How are you going to argue that? And so a crisis begins to form. Czechoslovakia exists. Here's the Sudetenland. It's full of German people. We're planning to occupy that and take it over. And now the Western allies are beginning to get a bit prickly about it all. They're like... How far is this cat going to go? What if we throw him another bone, let him have the Sudetenland? So what they do, in a nutshell, is utterly sell out Czechoslovakia. All right, Neville Chamberlain, the great prime minister of Britain at the time, and the leaders of France and the leaders of Italy, they all go to Germany, have a little meeting with Herr Hitler, and they make an agreement with him known as the Munich Agreement now, or the Munich Betrayal, depending on who you're talking to, where they say, okay, you can have the Sudetenland, you can basically have Czechoslovakia, if you promise, Addy, 
not to attack anybody else. And we're drawing the line at Poland, all right? Poland is where we draw the line. And we're letting you have all this other territory. We're not firing a shot. Don't want a war, man. And so Hitler says, okay, sure, sounds great. I won't attack anybody else. Scouts honor. And so the Germans occupy half of Czechoslovakia. Hungary pops up and takes the other half. And all of a sudden, Czechoslovakia functionally ceases to exist. And the Czechoslovak people are like, hello, what did you just do to us, man? Well, what we just did to you was sacrifice you for what Chamberlain came home toting as peace in our time. Peace in our time, 1938. We did it, kids. We did it. We appeased the little guy. He said he's not going to step his toes on anybody else's borders. We're all good. And we can trust him. We can trust him because he's proven himself so trustworthy so far. And, of course, almost immediately, Hitler turns around and invades Poland, just like he said he wasn't gonna. And the Allies have drawn their line in the sand at Poland. And so, reluctantly, declarations of war are declared. And suddenly, the world finds itself, not all that surprisingly, into World War II. You know, there had been people, way back when the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919, prescient people, smart people, who looked at it and said, you know, uh, this is not peace. <laughs> this is not a lasting peace. This is an armistice for 20 years. What you're doing is fanning the flames of anger in Germany. You are extending this war, all right, because they put on the war guilt clause and reparations that crippled the German economy. There was what they called the stab in the back lie, Hitler exploited this. This notion at the end of World War I, Germany was still dug in on Belgian soil, on French soil. You know, nobody had set foot in Germany yet. Our army was still in the field, in enemy territory, not defeated. And we were sold out. We were sold out by Bolshevists. We were sold out by Jews that infiltrated our government. The great victorious German army of 1918 was sold out by these enemies to the German state. And Hitler exploited that myth to the hilt and used it to make scapegoats of Jews, make scapegoats of Bolshevists. We know how all that turned out, man. People who read the Treaty of Versailles looked at this and said, this is not making the war end. This is merely extending it. And all we're doing is taking 20 years off to rearm, to generate more folks to die in the resumption of this conflict. You know, you can look at it as all one war stretched out over 20 years, you know. Let's not go that deep on it, all right? And so war is declared 1939, and the French come out to man the defenses. The notion was, we'll have a defensive war. And so the French had spent the interwar years, the 20s and 30s, building defenses, all right? They built what they called the Maginot Line. Basically, a huge, massive, reinforced concrete wall that ran from Switzerland up to the edge of the Ardennes Forest, which was thought to be impassable. So they're like, here's what we're going to do. We are going to prepare to fight the next war by setting up these fabulous freaking defenses. And what they did functionally is create defenses that were ideal to win World War I. <laughs> they built impenetrable defenses of the sort that could win you World War I. Problem is, World War I was 20 freaking years ago, Jack. You can win that war all you want. It's passe. We're at World War II now. So the British show up 1939, man the defenses. The French come out to man their defenses. The notion is a defensive war. And then they're hoping that the Nazis will blow themselves out. It won't be like it was. And it'll be over very quickly. So 1939, they come out, they occupy the defenses, they point their guns at Germany. 
and they wait, and nothing happens. <laughs> nothing happens. They call this period of the war the phony war, right? Because they're all out there manning the ramparts, standing upon the Maginot line, and ain't nobody around, all right? The French made a brief foray into Germany and then retreated, 1939, stood up on the parapet and waited, and nothing happened. Germany turned their eyes to Scandinavia, went on little adventures in Norway, Finland, securing their resources for a long war effort because they weren't prepped. They were not ready at that point in time to really mount a full-on attack against real armies, against real militaries like the British and the French. Attack Poland, sure. Attack Norway. Dealing with the British and the French, a much, much different thing. So they sat there for months and months and months, waiting for something to happen, and nothing happened until it did. And the phony war ended in a real, real way. When Hitler at last turned his blitzkrieg, his lightning war, toward the West. And the West was not at all ready. <laughs> was not at all prepared for what was coming. All right. They built the Maginot Line because nobody can cross the Maginot Line. And Hitler said, uh... Hans, haven't we an aircraft that can fly over the Maginot Line? Yeah, mein Führer, we have those. Oh, that's cool. And they said, you know, is it all that impossible to attack through the Ardennes Forest like the French think? Nein, mein Führer, we can go through the forest. And they did. And so everybody's standing on the Maginot Line, and the planes just flew over it. <laughs> and the tanks just went around it. And in they went to France. Long story short, you know, the Germans could not conquer France in four years of fighting in the First World War. They took it in six weeks. May 1940 into June 1940, they just took it in six weeks, all right? They pushed the British and the French, what remained of those armies, up against the coast. The evacuation at Dunkirk, go watch the movie, it's pretty fascinating. You know, they managed to airlift or boat lift 300,000 troops out of northern France. Thank goodness for that. Would come in useful later. But, you know, a million and a half French soldiers were captured. France was conquered. Again, they marched into Paris unopposed in 1940. And so what happened after that is the vindictive Hitler made the French sign a peace agreement, made the French surrender in the very same rail car where Germany was forced to surrender in 1918. Hitler, great at symbols, you know what I mean? Great at sentiment in his own twisted way. Made the French surrender in the same railroad car where Germany had surrendered, finally winning World War I in his mind. And so France was conquered and split in two, all right? So the General Pétain became the leader of what was called Free France or Vichy France in the south, and the north was occupied by German forces, okay? Ostensibly to defend, or well, first to attack Britain. <laughs> the Battle of Britain came thereafter. And then later to defend against attacks from Britain, which we know happened D-Day 1944, okay? So this is 20 minutes of telling you why Alo Alo exists. Alo Alo is set in the occupied part of France. All right, so I guess it starts 1940s, 1940, and it's a sitcom. And what a premise for a sitcom. Now, at the time, in the 60s, 70s, I guess there had been television dramas about the war years, the Secret Army being a big one. That was a drama set, I think, in Belgium, during the occupied Belgium during the war years. And it was to do with the resistance, the Belgian resistance, German occupiers, looting of antiques, paintings, this kind of stuff. There was a lot of intrigue 
And it was knife edge stuff. It was a drama about life in these occupied territories. Well, along come the creators of Alo Alo, and it's like, we're going to do that too, but we're going to spoof it. <laughs> we're going to spoof it. And so the action in this program centers around a cafe in the town of Nouvion, France, this little village. And the cafe owner is René Artois, who is the world's luckiest coward. <laughs> A complete coward and philanderer, you know, René Artois, who is, at the same time, a pawn of the German occupiers and a pawn of the French resistance. And this whole thing, this whole sitcom, centers around just repeated storylines that intertwine and blackmail as René tries to not get shot by the resistance and not get shot by the German occupiers who are using him for different things, all right? The resistance are trying to help British airmen who have been shot down. And there's a painting, the fallen Madonna with the big boobies, Vi Van Klomp, priceless, that Hitler wants. Everybody wants the fallen Madonna with the big boobies because the idea is we're going to get that. We're going to, it's priceless. We're going to sell it after the war. So the town commandant, Colonel von Strom, he wants it. The local Gestapo head, Herr Flick, he wants it. The resistance want it. Everybody wants the fallen Madonna with the big boobies. And then there are forgeries of it. And plot lines swirl around who has the painting, who has the forgeries. How do we get it back? Do we have the right one? And it just intertangles all around. And it is really, really funny. I mean, it is a Britcom of the 1980s. It is pure farce, pure satire, pratfalls, sight gags, relentless innuendo, the sort of stuff you couldn't get away with now. <laughs> you just couldn't get away. First of all, you couldn't get away probably with people walking around in Nazi uniforms. You couldn't get away with jokes about swastikas, you know? It's like we have to whitewash history. It's like none of this existed, you know? It's weird how the notion now is to protect everybody from history. That's a bad idea, man, all right? There are tasteful ways to do this, but protecting people from history, you know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. You couldn't get away with a low, a low now, and I find that sad, all right? But the premise, I mean, it's a risky premise. Let's make jokes about Nazis, etc. But the thing about it is, it's lighthearted right? It is not in any way malicious or vicious. It's lighthearted. It's immeasurably silly. And the fun part is that, I mean, they have a practical problem here, which is we have all these different nationalities. We have French people. We have German people. We have English people. We have eventually Italian people. It's like, how do we have them communicate? Because, you know, nobody can. We can't subtitle everything. We can't get people speaking the native languages. So what do we do? Well, we stage it. We, we use stage accents, right? So the actors who are playing German characters speak with a German accent, right? And those who are playing the French characters are all French. You know what I mean? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the English characters are all pip, pip, cheerio. You know, this, this carry on war stuff. And the Germans are humorless and kinky. The French are relentlessly horny. The Germans, sorry, the English are just kind of goofy and stupid. It's a send up of everybody. And it's so funny to listen. To, you know, you buy it very, very quickly. It just becomes normal. All right. You understand. The French and the Germans understand each other in their different accents. Nobody understands the English. The English don't understand anybody. And it's really, really funny. It's just really, really funny. And it is pure farce slapstick. All right. This ran for eight or nine seasons, something like 85 episodes. And they're all on Prime, kids. They are on your Amazon Prime. Hello, hello. The title being a reference to the greeting that would come through the wireless radio, which was stored upstairs under the bed of René Artois' ailing mother-in-law. <laughs> Hijinks ensue 
And we gotta get to the radio. Okay. Hello, hello. Pass your message, and I talk. It's so funny. And if you are a history person, even though the history is not super representative, okay, but it's interesting to look at, and it's interesting to imagine, and it's interesting to laugh at this. But you know, as is typical of an 80s sitcom, particularly a British one, there has to be a gay character. And I have talked about this sort of thing before, you know, with reference to an episode of Night Court back in the mid to late 80s, where they had a gay character just for one episode, and he was just a guy. This was an unusual thing. It was very unusual, if you'll pardon the pun, to play a gay character straight, meaning not as the butt of jokes. This was, at the time... Really revolutionary stuff, because we had had Three's Company, where most of the jokes, the whole premise of that show is that Jack Tripper is allowed to live with two girls because he's gay. A, it's the 1970s, for crying out loud. Really, it's that much of a scandal for a guy to be living with two girls platonically? If we can look past that, the whole thing was to set up a reason why Jack had to pretend to be gay so he could get away with living that. And what happens is there's all sorts of really lame jokes about homosexuality, about homosexual people. And, you know, you've got Mr. Roper doing the, I don't know, I can't, I'm not doing video here. So, like, you know, just this sort of stereotypical gay kind of gestures, you know. And this is the butt of jokes and it was okay at the time you know to make the gay character the butt of the joke and then along comes night court with this character in an episode who's in court on for whatever reason i can't remember the premise of the case and he's just a guy he's just a guy he's not flamboyant he's not in any way a stereotype the stereotype becomes dan fielding and his reaction to the gay person and so the, it skewers very hard these attitudes about homosexuality and how prejudiced and how sad and how pathetic some of those prejudices are, you know? Very revolutionary at the time, and you would not expect that of Night Court, which was so lecherous <laughs> and so campy, you know? It seemed the perfect show to perpetuate this sort of campy stereotype of the gay character did not do that, played it with a lot of dignity and put the joke back on the people who carry these prejudices. Pretty cool, man. But, hello, hello, you have to have that character. I think it was, I think it was typical of a lot of British programs at the time. It's like you had to have this token kind of effeminate gay character who becomes the butt of jokes. You know, and that is Lieutenant Gruber. He is the guy who fancies Rene. And so Rene has got to sort of, he's got to deal with, the thing is, Rene is the most wanted man in all of New Vion. <laughs> he's having affairs with both of his waitresses, hiding them from his wife. And Lieutenant Gruber wants him as well because everybody wants Rene, who is this sort of overweight, balding, middle-aged man with all this French sex appeal, you know. And there's a lot of funny stuff, all right? There's a lot of funny slapstick, a lot of funny situational stuff with Rene trying to hide from Yvette and hide from Maria and all the other women who want him and keep that from his sort of dowdy middle-aged wife, Edith, who can't carry a tune in the bucket. And it's just funny watching that happen. You know, you have to reserve your moral judgments, I suppose. This is a slapstick comedy, okay? Let's not take it too freaking seriously. But, you know, Lieutenant Gruber is, although he's treated gently and with affection, bears the brunt of some of the jokes, and there's some pretty blatant stuff in there that is like, nine, we, we, can't, we can't say that. <laughs> we can't do that now. Sometimes you have to take a look at the artifact in contemporary times. You have to look at the artifact in its own time. And this is how, you know, the presence of gay characters on television 
was probably a pretty new freaking thing. So, you know, it was for a long time, we look the other way. We pretend this does not exist in the world, right? So we had at least reached a point where we were acknowledging that this exists, but we were not treating it kindly, all right? We were treating it for jokes. Lieutenant Gruber is treated that way. But again, you have to look at it and say, okay, this was contemporary at the times. We have evolved. The wheel of perception has evolved in 40 years since that show debuted, all right? And that is to our credit. (laughs) That is to our credit as societies that we hold fewer I can't say it's eradicated, but we hold fewer of these prejudices and we have reached a level of consciousness whereby we can look at that and say, that's not really okay, man. It's not really okay to treat a character that way based on the sexuality. But there's a lot of cross-dressing. There's a lot of really hilarious sight gags. And the show is acted, it's like a theater piece, really. It almost feels like a stage play. And the way it's set up and the way it's sort of executed feels like a stage play, some brilliant acting, some flat out camp, some flat out slapstick, also some really subtle stuff though. That's quite funny, really well acted and really with a lot of heart. It's another of these good hearted programs. All right. Maybe you've got to look past some of what was representative at the times. You can be aware of that and still laugh, you know. You can be aware of that and still laugh at what's funny and what was well done. And these characters, German, French, English, whatever, there are no enemies here. You know what I mean? It's all just a big gag. And it's a send-up of shows that treated this this material much more seriously. And when I was a kid, I freaking loved it. All right. You probably saw a low, a low. If you're old enough back in the eighties, you probably in the nineties, you probably saw this on rerun, most likely on your local PBS station. And I can remember being a teenager, my boy Clugger and I freaking loved a low, a low because it was hilarious. And the girls were hot. (laughs) Even the 1940s girls were hot. You know what I mean? And Anytime we happened upon this being on TV, it was like celebration time. Oh, wow. There's an episode of Hello, Hello we can watch. And it was so funny and we loved it. And so there's that extra wrinkle for me. (laughs) This clugger is gone now. So when I see an episode, I can laugh and I can think to him, you know, dude, remember this one? Funny. And we didn't get to see the end. You know, there's like eight or nine seasons of this. And we only saw parts of the first I don't know, four or five seasons, maybe. And I got to tell you, the first season is quite hilarious. Go on to Prime, watch the first season of Hello, Hello. It's probably the best one where you're meeting some of these characters. Sam Kelly as Hans Gehring is such a freaking funny actor, such a good character. You know, he's the sort of second in command, the right-hand man of Colonel von Strom, the town commandant. And he's a moron. You know, he's the dumb character, the well-intentioned, bumbling, kind of moron character from the dark side, you know, with a funny voice and a funny accent. And he's just really good. You know, the acting is so funny. But we never got to see the end. And so I began at a certain point in the early 2000s to buy the DVDs from the Amazon. All right. Pre-streaming again. I bought the DVDs. For a low, a low. So I've got them up to a point. I got, I don't know, four or five seasons, but it's like, this is getting to be expensive. <laughs> Can't really do it. So I stopped buying them. And then when the streaming started and we signed up for Amazon Prime, I went on there poking around. It's like, there's a ton of British stuff on here. Cool. And oh, and one day I had the bright idea. Do they have a low, a low? And they did. They had the whole dang series. And so I was finally. Over 20 years later, able, nearly 30 years later, able to watch the actual ending of the freaking show. And it warms my cockles, man. Finally, I got to see how this freaking show resolved. And it ends. I mean, I want to give away the whole freaking show, but it follows the chronology of the war. You know as well as I do, eventually in 1945, 
France was liberated, you know, parts of it in 1944. And so this show has that ending hard stop, right? Eventually, the Allies are going to come to Café René and what's going to happen. And in the final season, we jump ahead and we get to see some of that. And that's compelling. It's compelling, after having watched all these years of this show, to kind of see that actual historical part of it come into play, you know? Very interesting. And so if you are a history person or a comedy person, it's worth going to watch and it's fun. And I'm glad that it exists on Prime and I can actually watch it. And I'm planning to watch the whole dang thing, all 85 episodes or whatever it is. I'm into season two now. I'm laughing. I'm having my cockles warmed. I'm remembering. And it's just fun, you know? Gives me a little bit of a chance to talk superficially about some history. I mean, you don't do World War II in half an hour, you know what I mean? So go watch a low, a low. You need a laugh. You need something a little bit different. That's on Prime. If you have a Prime membership, it's free. You don't have to pay extra for it. And it's just silly. It's silly and goofy. And you know what, kids? Sometimes silly and goofy is exactly what you need. I needed it during the pandemic. Ted Lasso provided a lot of that. I need it now. Maybe you need it now, too. So that's me saying, I've been watching a low, a low in lieu of Ted Lasso and Frasier, all right? (laughs) It only took me, you know, almost 50 minutes to get to that, which leaves very, very little time for the Patreon plug. And I'm not going to do the full exhaustive Patreon plug. If you've come this far, thank you so much. There is a Patreon page for this podcast. It is patreon.com slash John Huff podcast, where for the low, low membership price of $5 a month, you can support the program. Think of it as paying me a $1.25 tip for every episode I do. If you are getting something from this podcast, edification, entertainment, education, learning about new music, having your cockles warmed in some way. Please consider supporting via Patreon. It saves me filling this podcast with ad reads that I do not want to do and you do not want to hear. Out of the goodness of your heart, that's what makes Patreon so great. It is voluntary. If you enjoy this show, if you want to throw me a tip that way, please consider doing so. $5 a month, patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. Thank you to everyone who has done that so far. Mucho appreciado. Don't want to do that. That's cool. The show will remain free and accessible where you enjoy fine podcasts. You can help me by sharing the episodes, share them on Facebook, share them on Instagram, wherever, you know, word of mouth is still the best advertising. I'm learning that. So if you got friends who need to pick me up, you got friends who like a little bit of positive talk about music and history and whatever, even those who can laugh about shows about Nazis, (laughs) please tip them off to the program. Finally, ratings and reviews really help. They genuinely help, kids. They genuinely help. Take five seconds. Please leave me a five-star rating on your preferred podcast platform. Take a minute. Leave a little bit of a review that says, I enjoy this. I get something from this. You might enjoy it too. It helps me enormously. Please consider doing that, and I thank you so much. Do I have the time and the voice left for a music recommendation. I'm going to do it real quick. I plan to spend more time on what follows. I don't know what's going on, but there seems to be a bit of Cinderella in the air (laughs) just now. According to a couple of new songs that were released in the past couple of weeks, the first is by an act calling itself Gardner James. And that is Janet Gardner, our old friend Janet Gardner, formerly of Vixen. All right, she was the voice of Vixen back in the glory days. Some of you younger people may not know Vixen, but they were quite a sensation back in the middle to late 80s as the kind of preeminent all-girl hair metal slash glam metal band. Very difficult to distinguish Vixen. (laughs) from some of their male contemporaries, but they were a really a breath of fresh air because finally we were looking at these hot girls and we could acknowledge that they were hot girls because Poison were hot girls too, but we had some sort of trouble acknowledging that. There was a cognitive dissonance there. (laughs) 
Vixen were actually hot girls and we could acknowledge that they were hot girls. And I still follow Roxy Petrucci, the drummer, on the Instagram and she's great. I'd love to have Roxy on the show. That'd be fun, man. But back in the glory days, the singer was Janet Gardner and their run ended sort of early 90s like everybody else's did. And then there have been iterations of Vixen since. Janet was part of it off and on. She's not part of it now. She's doing this collaboration with Justin James, who I believe is actually her romantic partner. I don't know if they're married or not, but they're doing this hard rock thing. And they have just released a song called I'm Living Free. And it's a cool song, but it's Cinderella. (laughs) <laughs> it's not just, hey, this sounds like Cinderella. It is the riff from Falling Apart at the Seams, which was the first proper song on Cinderella's monumental Long Cold Winter record. That song starts off with Tom Kiefer playing, you know, slag guitar, bad seamstress blues, right? The way only Tom Kiefer could back in that scene. He's a blues man, dude. He's a blues man. And then he plays that acoustic thing. I remember hearing that for the first time cruising down the road and I'm like this doesn't sound like the Cinderella I know (laughs) you know it's acoustic guitar with a slide and Tom singing in his normal voice looking on back when I was young and I was like "Uh, I don't know if I dig this man this isn't even rock and roll what the heck but it was just a teaser just a teaser man and so Bad Seamstress Blues is like whatever it is a minute long and then he gets to the end of it, and Tom Keeper's like, let's go, boys. And then they kick in for real into Falling Apart at the Seams. Badass slide guitar riff. I mean, this is a killer freaking track. One of my favorite Cinderella songs. I play it on the drums once in a while, and you just dig in. It's another lip-curling song. <laughs> very recognizable, a simple but very recognizable riff. And simple and recognizable enough that when this new song by Gardner James starts, I'm living free, you're like, that's falling apart at the seams by Cinderella. It's the same. It's the same riff. It's not even like, that sounds a bit like it. It's it. It's identical. And I'm not sure why Janet would do that. I don't know if it was like a tribute to Tom. I'm sure she knows him. I mean, for crying out loud, Vixen was part of the scene just like Cinderella and a big part of it back in the day. I'm sure they played together. Sure, they know each other. It's like, you know, you're straight up. Either you're either paying tribute to Cinderella's falling apart at the seams, or you're outright ripping it off, Janet. And I don't really know what to say about that. They're, you know, and in the chorus, that's the riff. They sing the chorus over that riff. The rest of the song is not that. The rest of the song is much different. It's a cool song. All right. It's great guitar work. It's a glam metal sounding song for the modern era. We're hearing a lot of that these days. And who better to do it than Janet Gardner, right? It's a cool song. I like the song, but I can't get past this dissonance, which is, that's Tom Kiefer's riff. (laughs) I mean, that's Tom Kiefer's riff. It's the same. And I don't know what to make of that. I've not seen any literature out there that suggests it was intentional. But I'm like, you can't not know. It's not like it came from some obscure Christian glam metal from 1988. It's from freaking Cinderella's Long Cold Winter. That's a platinum record, and it's the first song. (laughs) It's like, you gotta know. Like, when you were making up that riff, did it occur to you? Like, this sounds like something. Sounds like something I should know. Maybe it did, and maybe it is a tribute. Maybe it is a tribute. And I say that because there's another song out right now, and it's by a band called Hell in the Club, a band from Italy, all right? Hell in the Club. And they've just released a single called Sidoni. I guess it's called Sidoni. S-I-D-O-N-I-E. And I had it on my list. You know, every week I accumulate a list of new stuff to listen to, see what might be worth talking about on the podcast. And I listen to this song and the, it's another hard rock tune, right? It's got that throwback, got that 80s vibe. Cool, I dig it. And then the dude starts singing and it's like, uh... He's singing Shake Me by Cinderella. (laughs) Like the lyrics are the same. It's the same lyrics, more or less. All right. Not all of the lyrics, but some of them, some of the lines are straight up lifted 
from Shake Me by Cinderella. And I'm like, what's going on here? Did Tom Kiefer die and I didn't know about it and all these tributes are coming out? So I'm listening and it repeats several lines from Shake Me by Cinderella. And I'm like, I just heard Janet Gardner ripping off Falling Apart at the Seams. I'm hearing this band singing verbatim lyrics from Shake Me. But in this case, Hell in the Club, I find out that that's more or less intentional, right? They have a new record coming out called FUBAR. Not sure how Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to feel about that because he has a new series called FUBAR. In any case, new record called FUBAR, and they are billing this as a tribute, quote unquote, to the sounds and styles of those 80s glam bands, Dokken, Crew, Cinderella. And so I feel as though the use of those lyrics in this song is intentional and an actual nod to Cinderella. And I'm not sure Janet Gardner's song is an actual nod to Cinderella. Maybe it is. And if it is, I apologize. (laughs) I apologize for seeming to make it otherwise. But here we have Hell in the Club. Been around a long time, apparently. Got several records out. And it's another cool song. All right, I like this tune a lot. And it's got that glam throwback. Great guitar work, great guitar tones. It's riffy, big chorus. But it's just, again, initially at least, this weird dissonance about these are Cinderella lyrics. So I guess it's Cinderella time. (laughs) I guess the thing to do right now is to be tributing or ripping off one or the other Cinderella. And I'm all for that. All right. Cinderella is one of my favorite freaking bands. You know, I love Cinderella. When I was in Hearts, one of the things I was trying to channel on the sly, because everybody else in the band was 10 years younger than me, not perhaps into Cinderella, I was trying to pull Cinderella vibes into the music. So if you listen to a lot of the music from when I was in the band, it's got a Cinderella kind of edge to it. Some of those bluesy riffs, some of those kinds of choruses. And we even had Tyler, the guitar player, one night playing slide guitar with a beer bottle. And how rock and roll is that? So I'm all for Cinderella flavors coming into modern rock music. I just find it somewhat disorienting to see it so blatant. But again, in the case of Hell in the Club, It appears that that's intentional, and so, okay, fantastic. This is a cool song. It does have kind of a docking vibe to it. It's got that chorus. The singer, the singer sounds like Vince Neil might have sounded (laughs) if he had just a little bit extra edge on his voice, maybe. You know, Vince's vocals were actually pretty clean for the most part. If it had a bit more stank on it, like I think John Carabi had, Vince might have sounded a little bit like that. And so if you are a fan of Crew and Dawkins and Cinderella and whatever, and again, you're one of these people who are looking for the revival of that kind of sound, Hell in the Club is doing it. They are doing it gleefully. This is a tribute to that style of music, this whole record. So check out that song, Sidoni, S-I-D-O-N-I-E. I do not, Sidonie, I don't know how you pronounce that. I don't know if it's Italian. I don't know what it means, but that's what it is. Might be worth checking out. We'll see what the record's like. Go listen to the Gardner James song. If you can get past the falling apart at the seams part, then it's a cool song, you know? And Janet Gardner's great. She's got this sound that is a little bit Lee Aaron in her voice, a little bit Doro Pesh, not quite as metal as Doro Pesh, but she's got that kind of flavor. You know, reminds me a little bit of that. Very good rock and roll singer, man. And it's nice to see that she's still around doing it. You know, Vixen is still around doing it. These bands are crushing it. They're in their 60s. Even the great Vixen is in their 60s. Still doing it, man. And you know what? Like, I made a a kind of a pledge to myself that I was going to shorten these episodes. You know, ideally, I'd like to get them into the 40, 45 range. And yet, they seem to be getting longer and longer and longer. So I'm going to go. I hope you have enjoyed this somewhat meandering foray into World War II and comedy. I don't know. That's just what was on my mind this week. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for listening. I am this time. I mean it. This time I'm going to shut up, shutting up. 
I will be back next week. Please take care of yourself. Good things do happen when you put yourself out there. And hey, I'll check you later. Yeah. I tried to sing it, but my song had been sung, and now I ain't got no worries, ain't got no one to call my own. But when I got just a little bit older, all I got had come on done. Let's go, boys. I don't understand half of it myself. Whew.